Hey everyone, and welcome to the Boost Your Biology podcast. My name is Lucas, and I am the founder of Ergogenic Health. Together in this podcast series, we will go underground to explore cutting edge health and human performance insights that you simply cannot search on Google to help you upgrade your existence. So without any further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Boost Your Biology podcast. Today, I have a naturopathic doctor and a functional medicine practitioner, Dr. Petty. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Awesome. So, Petty, I like to start out the podcast with getting to know my guests a little bit better and unveiling their story. So maybe you want to share with my listeners, how did you get into naturopathic medicine? Sure. So in my early 20s, I was fascinated about fitness. So I was doing a lot of working out, doing a lot of fitness competitions, and that led me to a career in personal training. And meanwhile, I thought I wanted to be a dentist. So I was doing pre-med. And so I started a personal training business while I was doing pre-med. And I started training others. And from there, my patients or my clients, I should say, came to me with nutrition challenges. And so that led me to a career in holistic nutrition. I went to nutrition school for two years. I studied nutrition and then I got my master's in kinesiology, worked in an obesity lab for two years, did research to teach me the powers of nutrition and lifestyle for optimal health. And as my business grew, I realized that more and more people were coming to me with you know, issues that I was not qualified to answer, nor did I really know how to answer more complicated health issues beyond just fitness. And so I knew that in order to continue to serve, I needed to up-level my understanding. And so from there, I decided to look into um, more schooling. And I was always fascinated about functional medicine. And that led me to naturopathic medicine. And then the rest is history. I applied, got in and You know, it's interesting. I thought I was doing pre-med to go to dentistry, but that didn't work out. And I ended up in naturopathic medicine, which was a lot more aligned with who I am, what I do, what I'm passionate about. And so I'm very passionate about sharing health and wellness like yourself with people and just trying to help as many people as we can. Absolutely, man. And it's very obvious the passion that you have. For those listening in, Dr. Petty has an amazing Instagram profile. He's also got a huge presence on TikTok as well. He creates tons of highly educational videos and really helpful little health tips similar to me there in that regard. But I'd love to dive deeper into some of the nutritional challenges that you noticed people were facing over the years because you've been you've been in clinic now for a number of years. Maybe did you want to start out with what are some of the challenges that you people face when it comes to nutrition? Right. That's a, the million dollar question, right? What is the right and perfect diet? And unfortunately, it's 2023 now. We're making so much advances in technology and medicine, but we're very confused about the most important topic in health, which is food and nutrition. And so there's a lot of conflicting evidence, a lot of different schools of thought. So a lot of people are confused, I really believe. And when I was doing my research, that must have been about 10 years ago in the obesity lab, Back then, it was a lot of mentality was all about calories in and calories out, looking as food as energy only. And now what we're realizing with the research is that food is a lot more than energy, right? Food is information for the body. And so I felt like that was a big issue. You know, people were really fixating and looking at food from an energy standpoint, very one dimensionally and overlooking the other effects that food could have on our body. Right. And I felt like that was a big challenge. And so that's why I was very passionate about expanding people's understanding on that topic and being like, hey, look, food is not only energy for the body, but it's information. It can affect our genetic expression. It can be inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. Right. It could turn on disease genes or turn off disease genes, an area of science called nutrigenomics, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And then food we eat could shift our microbiome to a state of balance or a state of imbalance called dysbiosis. Food is so much more than energy. It's information for the body, which I'm sure you're aware of. And so that was a big challenge for me, really getting people to look at it like that and to shift their perspective away from just calories. Because we know 
100 calories from French fries is not the same as 100 calories from an avocado. Yeah, it's, it's funny when I look back at how even my lens of nutrition has shifted over the years. And now that I understand so much about different biochemical pathways and different nutrients and bioavailable nutrients and flavonol, flavonoids and polyphenols, I'm starting to look at nutrition in such a different way. Like I look at how certain polyphenols can influence the growth of very specific bacteria like Akkermansia, for example. So have you found that now that you have so much knowledge in the space of nutrition, you feel like you're, you look at things from a naturopathic lens and do you find yourself doing that as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the more people I see, the more I realize that there really isn't a perfect one size fits all approach, right? Mm -hmm. The end of the day, everything is personalized, right? What works for you may not work for me and vice versa. So that's why with looking at things from a naturopathic perspective, I'm like, everything is truly patient specific. Everything is personalized. Absolutely. I think that's a trap that a lot of, I guess a lot of practitioners can fall into is assuming that there is like one fixed dietary model that will work for 90% of the population. Having said that though, there is, I think there is huge merit, for example, and I'm sure you've seen it in clinic as well, like with undergoing short-term, for example, a short-term carnivore diet, what have you seen in clinic? How would you assess the effectiveness of that sort of diet? It's funny that you asked that because I just finished running comprehensive labs on a patient who, against my advice, wanted to try that. <laughs> and so he went really heavy with the carnivore, lots of tallow, butter, raw milk, lots and lots of it, right? And so when he came into the office, we did advanced cardiovascular panel on him and inflammatory markers were elevated. LDL was so high, right? And this guy was crazy is that He's in great shape, low body fat, pecs, abs. He's like an athlete, he looks like. But when we did his lipids, holy cow, LDL was like 180, right? Wow. And uh, it was very high. Not only that, but uh, small dense LDL was elevated. Surprisingly, hemoglobin A1C was a little elevated. And I found out, I was like, why is his hemoglobin up? This guy's carnivore. He shouldn't be eating too much carbs, it seems. Like. Well, this guy was putting a lot of honey on everything too, right? So it was just honey and animal products. So his sugars were up, his inflammatory markers were up, and the lipids were up, which was really interesting because other patients of mine that do this, they can get away with it. But this guy couldn't. And, and I'm sure you understand and a lot of people are aware that we all process, some of us intake or absorb hyperabsorbers when it comes to fats and cholesterol. So genetically, some people could be affected more than others by a high meat, high fat diet. And I think that's what kind of set him apart. So it affects us all differently. And so there's another example of how, again, things are personalized, but it's interesting that you asked that question because it's been on my mind as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad that you were able to loop in client example there because that's, we see in theory things on paper, but then obviously like the real world application, the individuality. And so what that sort of makes me think of is, is it the removal of fiber? Could that be one of the one of the factors that's potentially contributing to his dysfunctional lipid panel, is it the combination of the saturated fat with the high carbohydrate intake and the fructose? There's many theories, like even I'm a little bit unsure about like, what is the reason for that? Why is his lipid panel so messed up? And whereas some other people can tolerate that fine. I think it comes down to the APOE4 gene. That mm. gene, if we have that APOE4 hit, even moderate fat diets could cause elevation in lipids. And so for those people, these diets are not suitable. And that's why anyone that asks me, hey, should I approach this? Can I do this diet? I'm like, yeah, you can do whatever you want, but just make sure someone's monitoring your lab markers, like the APOB, LDLP, small dense LDL, HSCRP, you know, APOB1, APOA ratio, all of these advanced cardiovascular panels, just make sure someone's monitoring them. In that scenario, for example, let's say the patient has undergone like a high saturated fat, let's say a carnivore diet or a modified version of it, then what would your approach be to correct their, let's say they're really concerned about their cholesterol parameters, they're really concerned about their LDL 
and the ratio between LDL and HDL. How would you go about it from a naturopathic perspective? I've got my own toolkit, but I'm curious to know, like, what, how do you go about addressing that? So I think at the end of the day, it's patient specific and what is driving that elevation in cortisol? Because there are factors besides nutrition that could drive elevations in cortisol, like low thyroid state can drive elevations in cortisol. I mean, elevations of cholesterol, I should say, I said yeah. cortisol. Yeah, low thyroid state could contribute to elevations in cholesterol. So it should be patient specific. Whereas my approach is obviously, first and foremost, we got to look at the nutrition and the lifestyle, right? What's the person eating? How much saturated fats? coconut products. I'm not against these things, right? But some people are just overdoing it, you know, butter, lard, bacon, saturated fat. So I would just try to gauge how much of that are they eating. And then touching on fiber, like you said, how much fiber are they getting? Because fiber obviously helps with managing cholesterol. And then are they sedentary? Do they have excess body weight? Because if they're not moving, if they have excess body weight, then, you know, there's low hanging fruit there for us to drop some pounds, get moving, hit the 10,000 steps a day, get some resistance training, shift that body composition, build some muscle, decrease the body fat, and all of those things could really help. And then there's obviously the nutraceuticals, which are a whole other discussion to use supplements and whatnot. Yeah, I think it's a really pragmatic and logical approach. I think you hit the nail on the head, like looking at identifying and this is where it all comes back to what we studied, which is naturopathic medicine, always going back to the very root cause. And so this is something that I know you've emphasized a lot. I probably am a little bit guilty for not emphasizing it enough on my social media channels, like just really trying to peel back the layers and look at the root cause because I'm, I am very supplementation heavy, but that's because I do believe in the efficacy and power of the nutraceuticals and different herbal extracts and dihydroberberine and all these novel ingredients. It's an area that I love. And I guess that's because um, my dad's a pharmacist. And so I'm very, I was, I grew up in the pharmacy. So I, that's how I was like trained was like, oh, you got this issue, prescribe this medication or right. suggest this. So it's a bit well, of- Our first inclination is to do that, right? So hmm. the Western medical system, they give a pill for each ill, whereas sometimes- I want to make that same mistake too. I call it getting sick to the supplement. So it's a pill to the pill or sick to the supplements. It's a similar thing, but I think it's on us to really try to look upstream. What's driving the training? And so I think that's the part of what we do that I really love because I feel like I'm the health yeah. detective. I try to really gather information, ask the right questions to get that little piece of information that if it's overlooked, it'll make it challenging. And then also supplements are great. Don't get me wrong. All my patients are on supplements. I'm on supplements myself, but how long can you take handfuls of supplements, right? So mm. that's why I think supplements are great in that they're used to accelerate the healing process and maintain some supplements should be taken forever for some people. Yes. But at the end of the day, we got to get to the root cause of what's going on as well. And supplements can help with the root cause sometimes. Absolutely. There's another like area within health that I think is, again, I don't really talk about it a lot, but I'm getting towards it eventually is, and I'd imagine you've done tons of research in this realm because you know, you're really into gut health and the microbiome from clinical experience, like looking at patients that have gut issues, where do you think majority of their gut issues are stemming from? Like, what are some of the common mistakes clients making when they're trying to improve their gut health, for example? Right. So I think that's a couple of questions you asked there. As far as where are the gut issues coming from, that can go way back to birth. So the way that you come into the world, whether you're natural birth or a cesarean C-section, that affects your gut microbiome. Because if we remember, the gut before birth is a sterile environment, Right. The first time it gets colonized with bacteria is by passing through the vaginal canal at birth. So some of that fluid enters the body of the baby and that stimulates the bacteria to be produced. And so birth is a factor that affects gut. And then whether we were breastfed, bottle fed, that is another factor that affects gut going all the way back, but up to more recent nutrition and lifestyle factors I think at the end of the day, it comes from the 
I don't know if you're familiar with this world word because you're on the other part of the world, but we call it the sad diet, the standard American diet. Right? We have the same. We have the same. It's just you swap the American for Australian. This- oh, there you go. Perfect. You guys, <laughs> there you go. So, you know, the sad diet we like to call it. And it is sad, right? Because it's just so highly processed. It's not nutrient dense. And what's fascinating is we consume approximately 3,000 pounds of food a year right? That's a lot of food and a lot of information that this poor digestive tract needs to process. And so if it's constantly processing garbage food, low nutrients, low fiber, low phytonutrients, low vitamin mineral, filled with hormones and antibiotics and toxins, all of that is going to add up. It's going to put a strain on the digestive system and affect it negatively. And then you throw on other lifestyle factors like alcohol, antibiotic use, all those things, stress shifts the microbiome, right? Add in all those lifestyle factors and we have a recipe for disaster. So it's a perfect storm. I'm glad that you also highlighted the the impact of alcohol on the microbiome. This is something that I could probably, we could probably dedicate an entire episode to looking at how the, how alcohol can perturb and disrupt the microbiome. But from your experience, like what effect, what impact has that had with some of your clients? Maybe you've seen clients that have decided to completely remove alcohol. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So do you want so, to talk? Yeah. Sure. When we talk about alcohol, obviously the alcohol component, the ethanol component itself is damaging for the gut and the gut lining. But the other issue is things like wine and beer, right? They're so high in empty calories And like, I've had patients that will drink four or five glasses of wine in a night, and then they're wondering why they can't lose weight or why their blood sugar is high. It's okay. That was probably 60, 70 grams of sugar you consumed that night. That'll do it. Or people that they can't sleep at night. And then I find out, okay, they're drinking a lot because drinking makes you a light sleeper, right? Especially if you're drinking something like wine, you go to bed, your blood sugar comes crashing down at night. And your body produces cortisol to bring that blood sugar up. And then you wake up. So you're a light breather. You wake up. So that's something that I've noticed. And then I noticed alcohol could bring on sleep apnea for a lot of people. People that have sleep apnea, alcohol could make that worse. Disrupting sleep, disrupting the cortisol pattern. And so the effects of alcohol, we know on the gut, there's surely some effects on the gut. But alcohol could affect other aspects as well. Weight sleep quality, all those factors as well. Now, there's something that you have spoken quite extensively about, and this is an area that I'm also very passionate about, and that is, it is a, they use the colloquial term, which is like leaky gut. The official, the strict definition or the actual strict way of describing it is intestinal hyperpermeability. So, you know, we both know quite a lot in that area. Did you want to, first of all, explain to my listeners, what is intestinal hyperpermeability or leaky gut? And what are some of the leading triggers or causes for leaky gut? Sure, I would love to. So the digestive system is literally a hollow tube within us, right? It's this channel or a canal, like a tube-like thing that goes inside of us. And the walls of the digestive tract are lined with tiny cells called enterocytes, which are cells that are specific to the digestive lining. And these cells, like bricks of a house, should be stacked tightly on top of one another, tightly, so nothing can get through. Because if you have a house with bricks on it, if things like water or even cold air, if you live in places that are cold, get through, it affects the home. And so same thing with the digestive system. The cells should be tightly sealed so things can't get through. And what happens with intestinal hyperpermeability is that the cells become leaky. So little spaces open up between the cells and things get through that shouldn't get through into systemic systemic circulation. And so what gets through? Well, undigested food particles, LPS, which is a toxin that's given up by the detoxification and processing of food, all of those things could enter systemic circulation and piss the body off, for lack of better words, because right behind the walls of the digestive system, we have the immune system, right? The gout, as we call it, 
which is the majority of our digestive system lined in, within the immune system, that could get really affected. And a lot of times we think, oh, how do you support immune health? But you got to work on gut health, especially when it comes to any autoimmune type conditions, because if that immune system is dysregulated at the gut, it could lead to a host of issues. And so the next question is, what causes the cells of the intestine to become leaky? And if there's SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, chronic exposure to food allergens or sensitivities, alcoholism, a nutrient depletion, if we have low stores of the antioxidants, that can affect it. So increasing age actually is a risk factor for leaky gut. And so is infections, right? Parasitic infections, pathogens that can overgrow, all of those factors can contribute to the cells becoming leaky. Now, this is obviously, we can see that with an individual that suffers from leaky gut or intestinal hyperpermeability, some of the downstream ramifications or I guess side effects of that. You mentioned obviously autoimmune diseases, which many links now between intestinal hyperpermeability and rheumatoid arthritis and different forms of autoimmune diseases. I'm curious to know from your approach in clinic with patients by focusing at first on correcting their gut health, have you seen some pretty dramatic effects in terms of their health problems resolve? What sort of scenarios and situations have you seen it's fascinating what can happen when you just address the gut as hippocrates once said all disease begins in the gut right and i always ask my patients how their digestive system is regardless of what you come into my office for we're going to talk about your bowel movements we're going to talk about whether you're having any gi symptoms like gas bloating abdominal pain loose stools constipation undigested food in the stool, what your stool looks like, that's very valuable information. And so when you just address some of those factors, it's amazing what can happen. People come to me, oh, I feel achy, I'm in pain all the time. Okay, let's reduce some of those inflammatory foods that we know are causing inflammation. Let's give you some things to support digestion so you can absorb more of the nutrients from the food that you're eating. Because a lot of people think it's what you eat. It really isn't what you eat. It's what you're absorbing. It's a completely different ballgame. I have patients that have been taking the best supplements, handfuls. They come to me. I check their nutrients and they're low. And so they get blown away. How, how is it possible? I've been spending all this money taking all these supplements. How am I deficient? You're not absorbing. So by just ensuring that the gut is able to absorb more of the nutrients that it's taken in, the body just has a bit better chance of just thriving. Here's a quick little message to all men listening in to today's show. Do you want to double your energy levels, boost motivation, and increase your focus? If so, you may be interested in my epic men's energy program I've recently launched called Limitless. Now, Limitless is an exclusive 12-week program for men who want to go from feeling tired, unmotivated, or burnt out to highly energetic, driven, and focused. Within the program, I will analyze your own unique biology and lay out a fully personalized health protocol so that you can finally unlock peak physical and cognitive performance. Over the 12 weeks, you will have direct access to me to ensure your results, as well as the chance to join me live twice a week to ask me anything relating to health protocols and discover cutting edge men's health info to keep you at the top of your game. Now, spots in this program are extremely limited. So if you're interested in finding out more, make sure you go to bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot l y forward slash limitless program to reserve the next available call to see if you're a good fit that's b i t dot l y forward slash limitless program you'll also find this link in my bio on my instagram profile and also my youtube channel and speaking of absorption something that you've also posted quite a lot about is stomach acid now, this is one of the reasons why I even got into naturopathic medicine in the first place myself. 
I've got a little bit of a story here. Like I used to suffer from reflux or acid reflux, GERD, GORD. And from a very young age, my from the age of 15 or 16, my dad put me on. Since my dad's a pharmacist and that's all he knew, and that's fine. Yeah. That's how he trained, whatever. <clears throat> he put me on Nexium or acid reflux medications, Pantoprazole, Somac. And I was like, oh, this is great. I get to eat whatever I want. I'll just take the tablet every time I get a reflux and then I'm good to go. Like, everything's all good. And then I was like, one day I came across like an article learning about the importance of stomach acid and why you need stomach acid. And my whole paradigm just shifted. And I'm like, what the heck is going on here? And so I'm sure you've also heard this story numerous times. What you said before about it's not what you eat, it's what you absorb. And so where does absorption first start? Obviously, there's digestion always starts first thing in the mouth with the mechanical digestion or even smell, even scents and stuff like that. But yeah. the fact that if an individual has low stomach acid, which is also very common, how does that mm -hmm. impact absorption of nutrients? Greatly affects it. First and foremost, the stomach acid, we know it just goes there and breaks proteins apart. So it increases the surface area for the digestive enzymes from the pancreas and the small intestine to be able to digest better. So we know mm. that right away. And then secondly, stomach acid is crucial for the absorption of key minerals, iron, calcium, magnesium, and then B vitamins like B12. So crucial for the absorption of those. And when I have patients that come to me, oh, I'm not absorbing my iron, oh, my magnesium's low, those things. I'm always thinking, what's their stomach acid state look like? That is so crucial. And the thing is, it's very easy for our stomach acid levels to get suppressed because when we're stressed, and most of the society is constantly and chronically stressed nowadays, when we're stressed, we're towards fight or flight activation, right? Our nervous system gets shifted towards fight or flight. And when we're in that state, our digestive system is literally turned off, right? So if a tiger were to come attack us, our, our body, our nervous system would put all of the blood into our heart, into our muscles, so we could run away from the tiger. In that situation, there's no point of us being able to digest food or us have blood and perfusion in our digestive tract. No point, because we got to survive and get away from the tiger. But a lot of people are chronically stuck in that state. So their digestive system is not turned on. It's just turned off. So there's no acid production, no enzyme production. The motility gets affected, which is the movement of food through that pipe. So imagine a stressed person with no motility and enzymes and acid eats food. The food just sits there, right? And it's usually garbage food for the average person, right? For lack of better words, it just sits there, putrefies and ferments creating dysbiosis and a lot of uncomfortable digestive symptoms. I'm glad you also brought up motility because I want to talk about constipation because obviously as naturopaths, we're very obsessed and we love looking at stools. That's part of our job, really. Let's look at constipation. What's considered normal? Because I speak to a number of clients as well and they're like, yeah, I might go to the toilet, might go take a poop every couple of days or maybe every three days or they must, might skip a day. And I'm like, that's not good. Yeah. What do you also say? <laughs> I think you need to be going at least once a day. I think if you're missing the bowel movements regularly in the course of a week, I think we have a problem. And it's interesting you say that because there's such a variation in people's understanding of what's normal. I had a patient come to me. I asked her, I'm like, how many bowel movements do you have a day? She's like, a day? I'm like, how many bowel movements do you have a week? She's two. I'm like, you have two bowel movements a week. She's like, what? That's not normal. I'm like, no, that's not normal at all. <laughs> and it's funny because this patient came to me wanting to detoxify. What are good detox supplements? I'm like, hold on. Before you spend any money on supplements for detoxification, I think we need to make sure you're having bowel movements because that's the most important place where we eliminate toxins. So let's focus there first. So it's interesting, like you said, there's such a variation in people's understanding of what normal is, but I think you need to be going at least once or twice a day, ideally well-formed stool, like a snake and no undigested food in there, ideally, and of course, no blood. And this is also really important is what, and this is something that I've seen in a number of clients as well, is like the classic scenario of a hypothyroid condition 
the patient is cold, fatigued, brittle hair, difficulty losing weight, and then the, to top it off, the constipation. So let's look at, we can get into thyroid health soon because that's a huge topic by itself is optimizing thyroid health. But what do you think are some of the leading like fat or causes of constipation? Like what do you think are really some of the big culprits there? <clears throat> Firstly, I think it could be a fiber issue or a dehydration issue, right? So we need fiber and water to, for the stool to be formed enough to move along. And although fiber might not be for everyone, it could make some people worse. Just generally speaking, it's a low fiber issue because the average American gets like 17, maybe 15 grams of fiber a day or something, but we need at least 40 grams a day, right? And so low fiber, low water. And then the other thing is stress, right? If the motility of the digestive system is compromised, that food is not moving through that pipe very well. You're not going to have a complete evacuation. You're not going to be able to get the bowels out. So being in a state of constant stress can't help. So just shifting that nervous system into a state of parasympathetic rest and digest state, uh, I think it's crucial for getting things moving along and preventing constipation. Yeah. And what about as far as when it comes to, and I'm sure you've seen this post virus, I'm not going to mention what it is on this podcast, but like post viral fatigue, for example, and lack of energy, maybe brain fog, just general malaise and general tiredness. Where do you start and looking at a patient do you look at blood tests? Do you do a patient questionnaire survey? Do you go through what they're eating? Like when it comes to general fatigue or someone complaining about maybe, oh, Dr. Petty, I've got adrenal fatigue. What can I do? So where, so where are do we you- talking to, Are we talking to general person or the post-virus person? Because I think it's a little different what I would do. Well, let's look at the post-viral fatigue because that's something that I'm, a number of people have messaged me wanting assistance with, and I've got my own stacks and protocols for that. But how do you address the post viral fatigue? Yeah, so it's very inflammatory, right? So it's causing a lot of inflammation in people. In fact, I had a patient that came to me, a young man, 32 years old, he was a former runner, right? Marath not marathon runner, but he would do a lot of track and field, a lot of those things. And he got the he got sick with that virus. And he couldn't even walk to get mail from the mailbox. That's how fatigued he was and his balance was so affected. And so when he came to me, I did do some blood work because I love data, right? I love to draw blood and just look at data because it allows me to personalize things better. And then when people see their number on the blood lab, they're like, okay, this is where I am. This is where I want to be. So I got to commit to the plan. So it helps when people see that it's not in my head. There's something going on here. So his inflammatory markers were up. His antioxidants were very low and his B vitamins were low as well. And there was some indication of mitochondrial dysfunction as well, based on some of the markers that I checked. And so, of course, I just put them. I start my patients, the ones that want to quickly get better. I do IV therapy, weekly mm -hmm. IVs for four to six weeks, and then bi-weekly, quickly build up the nutrient levels as quickly as we can, lower the inflammation until we figure out what's going on with the gut, optimize absorption, and then we maintain with supplements. So this patient with the IV therapy and some NAD, NAD is an incredibly powerful mitochondrial cofactor. With the IV therapy, NAD therapy, within 12 weeks, he was 60, 70% back to normal. It was unbelievable what was happening. I think it has to come down to antioxidant support aggressively, vitamin C, glutathione, vitamin A, zinc, quercetin, all of those things I'm a big fan of. I like to use anti-inflammatory herbs as well, because I think there's definitely an infl inflammatory response that can persist. So giving some anti-inflammatory herbal support can help. And then supporting the mitochondria, which is huge for energy production. And obviously the antioxidants are important, CoQ10, magnesium, intermittent fasting, some cold exposure for those that can tolerate it, HIIT training, there's lots of nutrition and lifestyle ways to support the mitochondria. Optimizing yeah, I think you sleep. 
I think you've just outlined some absolutely fantastic modalities and interventions there. Starting with the IV therapy, I might even chime in and share my experience post viral fatigue. The only thing that really re kickstarted my energy back to what it was pre virus was administering IV vitamin C. I was doing 15 grams every week. I think it was like, oh, I was doing it once a week, which is still pretty conservative. You can go much more. I can go higher doses and I'm sure you've probably administered even higher and more frequent sessions, but that was enough to really get me back on my feet and to really just get rid of that lingering like brain fog and fatigue, just vitamin C. Absolutely. Very effective. And because the reason IV therapy is effective is because not only can you use higher dosages, but you're getting a hundred percent absorption, right? So like, Mm. I don't like to give more than 10 grams of vitamin C to my patients without checking their G6PD personally. But even at that dose, which is a decent amount, 10 grams, you couldn't take that orally, right? You couldn't take, you'd get loose stools for days, first of all, and then you wouldn't be able to absorb that much vitamin C. So there's great advantages to IV therapy, the amounts that you can use and the absorption. And we personalize every bag and I do it based on micronutrient evaluation. So I know exactly what B vitamins you need, how much vitamin C you need, how much zinc, glutathione, how much of those you need, and then I'll personalize it based on them. So there it's very personalized, high dose, high utilization. I'm really curious to know more about the micronutrient assessments. I'd imagine you've done probably thousands now with different clients. What are some of the, well, what would you say maybe like the top three micronutrients that are commonly low, for example? Magnesium. I would definitely say magnesium is very commonly low and some of the B vitamins, right? And then we know that stress depletes the Bs, depletes magnesium, right? So that makes sense. A lot of people are stressed and a lot of people are not absorbing very well. So there you go. B vitamin deficiencies, magnesium deficiency, very common. And then I would probably say... The omega-3s come back low often. The EPA, DHA can come back low often. And then I might see zinc and glutathione low as well. But that's pretty much everything. I think the most, the biggest one, like I said, was the magnesium and the B vitamins for sure. Maybe B12, that one comes back low often because maybe the stomach acid is low for a lot of people. Yep. Now, what about a different form of fatigue? Although they might have some of the same etiology or pathophysiology might be pretty similar just just general like adrenal fatigue scenario which just let's say we're looking at a typical client maybe in their mid 40s who's been working in the corporate environment relying on caffeine stimulants relying on not sleeping much this is the classic scenario which i'm sure you've seen lots of and then they come into the off they come into your clinic and they're like i think i have adrenal fatigue And then what do you do? How do you communicate to them? What do you say to them to help them heal? Sure. I like to test. I'll test their adrenals. I'll do a four-point salivary cortisol test to see what their cortisol rhythm looks like in the day. That could be helpful data because cortisol is supposed to increase in the morning, which wakes us up, pulls us out of bed. And as we go to sleep at night throughout the day, it'll go down, right? And then we relax and go to sleep. But what's happening, especially the people that you explain, the corporate people that are working a lot, before they go to bed, they're doing emails or they're on their computer. And so when you're exposing yourself to this blue light, you're increasing your cortisol because this blue light is very stimulating, right? And you don't want to increase your cortisol at night at all because you're not going to get good deep sleep. And I definitely educate them on that. I'm like sleep hygiene. We got to work on that sleeping environment. You got big meetings the next day. We need to make sure you're sharp. So just shut down everything one hour before bed. Just shut it down. And no technology, no screen time, no TVs. Read a book. Go old school, low tech. Do some of that. So I really educate them on the sleep hygiene piece. And then in the morning, encouraging them, hey, listen, Try to get some natural sunlight on your eyes when you wake up. So when you wake up, maybe open your blinds or go outside, sit on your balcony. If you have a dog, that's great. Take your dog for a walk. That's what I do. As soon as I wake up, get grab my dog, go outside. So those little things could really help with our biological clock, our circadian rhythms, right? And we are creatures of habit, right? 
our circadian rhythms are determined by our habits. And so if we can get those habits to align our circadian rhythm and really get things dialed in, then our sleep quality improves and even our hunger and thirst signal improves. I'm sure we've noticed that when we don't sleep well, the next day you feel like you're always hungry. The signals are just thrown off. So when we sleep well, our circadian rhythms are really dialed in very well. And that could really influence not only our energy levels and our cognition, but our appetite, our hormones, and so much more. So I really educate my patients on ways they could dial that in. And then obviously supporting their adrenal glands with vitamins that are helpful for the adrenal glands and your favorite adaptogen, ashwagandha. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling that was going to pop up in the conversation at one stage. It was the ashwagandha. <laughs> I think you did a really fantastic job of summarizing that and clearly articulating the major factors contributing to fatigue and how you go about correcting that. You mentioned one thing I'm curious to know, like your stance on, and that is like caffeine or coffee. What is your, what do you say to patients? Do you say, Hey, I'm not going to tell you to stop drinking coffee if you respond well to it. What is your stance there? So again, I think it's person specific. I have patients that come to me that are an AFib and they are very anxious. So for those people, I will say, hey, we got to relax with the coffee and caffeine. And then I have other patients that are okay. So I'm okay with them drinking one or two cups of coffee or green tea, whatever it may be, as long as it's from a clean source, right? It has to be organic. Can't be putting sugar in there, no milk in there. If you've got a black coffee with a little bit of honey and some organic almond milk, you know, I'm okay with that. As long as you're not having it late at night, it's disrupting your sleep. But earlier on during the day, I'm okay with that. But remember, this is as long as you're not using it as a crutch, right? As long as it's not, oh, I can't get out of bed. I need my cup of coffee. No, if that's what you're using it for, no. But if it's a nice ritual in the morning, it makes you more productive. You like the smell. You sit outside with your partner or your dog in a healthy setting like that. Sure, one or two cups, I'm okay with. So that's my stance. It's very personalized at the end of the day, I think, again. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And what about another pathway that we haven't really touched on is blood sugar stability. We've touched on adrenal fatigue, which this completely ties into that. We've skimmed over like mitochondrial function and mitochondrial dysfunction. Blood sugar control also factored into that. We looked at like post-viral fatigue, maybe blood sugar imbalances, maybe post-viral fatigue. But when it comes to looking at a patient and trying to teach them how they can optimize blood sugar balance and like, how do you go about explaining that to them? And why do you emphasize the importance of maintaining stable, at least somewhat stable levels of blood sugar? Sure. I'm sure a lot of us have experienced this. When we get very hungry, we can get irritable, right? Or angry, some worse than others. And that is when blood sugar dips too low. When our blood sugar dips, we could get our mood can get thrown off. But what can also happen is our adrenals could kick in and produce cortisol to bring that blood mm. sugar back up, right? And so if we're getting hits of cortisol all day because of blood sugar imbalances, it's not very helpful. It could lead to adrenal fatigue. And so the way I get this conversation started is by getting them to understand that, hey, some of my symptoms could be happening when my blood sugar is low or when I've gone five, six hours without eating. For example, if I have the anxious patient that comes in, I ask them, okay, when do you feel like the anxiety is worse? Okay, around two o'clock. Okay, and when did you have breakfast? Oh, 8 a.m. And you haven't eaten since two. Okay, so do you think maybe because you've gone six hours without eating something here, your blood sugar could be dipping and could be making the anxiety a little worse. And then, oh, okay, maybe I didn't think about that. So that is an angle that I take, or I have the people that say, at night, I'm an endless pit. I just, I come home from work all day, I'm good. My, I keep with, I do my fast, my intermittent fast, but then at the end of the night, after I put the kids to sleep, I'm an endless pit. I'm like, okay, are you having breakfast? No, I skip breakfast every morning, okay. Maybe if we front load some of your nutrients, get some protein in the morning and some healthy fats in there, maybe that will help stabilize the blood sugar better for the rest of the day. And when you pair it like that for them and they understand that 
hey, our body is like a machine, okay? It requires fuel to run all day. So we need to understand that the blood sugar is stable. If it's dipping, this machine is not going to be in an optimal state, regardless of how healthy you are, right? Even me, myself, I'm not saying I'm the healthiest person, but when my blood sugar dips, my cognition gets affected, right? Your cognition gets affected. You're not as sharp. So that's my approach to the blood sugar talk. Yeah. I'm curious to know, have you ever personally worn like a continuous glucose monitor yourself? What sort of experiments have you, yeah, what have you I done? Did do that. I did do that. And I was surprised actually, my blood sugar was pretty stable, but one, one thing that was spiking my blood sugar actually was coffee. It was wow. very interesting. Yeah. Coffee for me was spiking my blood sugar. So mm. after half an hour, 45 minutes after coffee, I was having high blood sugar, which was really interesting. I did a month of it and it was a cool experiment. I should have continued it, but I thought that thing was uncomfortable in my arm. I didn't like that. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's incredibly difficult in Australia for us to get our arms on it and not our hands on it, but it is incredibly difficult for Australians to use those without, if they don't have diabetes, like it's just, re it's really difficult. Really? <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, crazy. We've covered a bunch of really like, prevalent topics and areas that I think uh, my audience is really going to enjoy this podcast. And you've done such a great job at explaining everything in such a simple and easy to understand way. And I think that's definitely a strength of yours is like being able to distill really complex information into very easy to understand and easy to digest, no pun intended. You know, it, you've done a great job on your social media. So I'll make sure to leave those linked in the, in the podcast show notes and we'll probably do a flipped version of this soon. We'll probably do it this time next week or something where you get to interview me and we'll do a flipped approach. But was there any last final messages you have for my audience? If it comes to health or something really important that you really want to emphasize, like what would that message be? Yeah, I think my message at the end of the day is to just be mindful of the decisions that you make every day and to just be easy on yourself. If you slip up, it's not a big deal. Just try to wake up the next day and be better. And just try to be mindful of each decision that you make every day because it really does determine the trajectory of our health, right? There's no magic pill that we can take that's going to make us healthy and live forever. But the decisions that we make every day do. And that's why I'm really passionate about what I do and I love what you do because I feel like these little pearls of knowledge that we share really give people the knowledge and the ability to start accumulating and just get good momentum and shift that trajectory of their health out outcome because we are the creators of our destiny. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm also very extremely passionate about what I do and I have been from day one and I can see myself in this space for a number of years down the track and hopefully have some form of legacy. I don't know what that's going to be, but I want to discover something or bring something to market that's going to change the health space. But yeah, and no, I appreciate the feedback and yeah, I look forward to chatting with you again. Thank you for having me. Look forward to chatting with you again as well. Awesome. Thank you everyone for joining in to today's episode. For in-depth show notes and lessons learned, visit nofilter.media forward slash boost your biology. This has been a No Filter Media production. Say what you want.